Okay, guys, if you've even opened YouTube in the last two days, you know that Sony released a full-frame vlogging camera, a ZV-E1. And a lot of people are describing this camera as an FX3 on a budget. But when this guy came out, this is the Sony FX30. A lot of people describe this camera as an FX3 on a budget. So uh, which one is it? And which one should you buy? Well, let's talk about it. So ever since my ZV-E1 breakdown, the comment that I've been getting the most, the question I've been getting the most is, should you get an FX30 or a ZV-E1? It makes a little bit of sense. They're both new releases by Sony, and this one is $1,800, and the ZV-E1 is $2,200. So what I'm going to do now is talk about the differences between the two cameras, and hopefully that will help you make a better decision in your life. Or you could be insane like me and buy both. Oh, and I should mention quickly, there will be affiliate links for both of these cameras down below. So if you're thinking about buying one, do old Marky a solid and click on that link, would you? So let's start with the advantages that this fantastic APS-C camera, the Sony FX30, has over the ZV-E1. Well, first and foremost, it is cheaper. It is $400 cheaper. So that is an advantage right there. But the value of this guy, it goes up a lot when you factor in the lenses. You can get fantastic APS-C lenses for the FX30 that don't cost as much as many full frame lenses. Right over here, this is the Sigma 16mm f1.4. It's about $350. One of the best lenses. It competes very much with my 24mm G Master. So if I use my 24mm G Master on this a7 IV and uh, I use the 16mm f1.4 on the FX30, both in S-Log3, you will get a very, very similar image. You'll get a similar field of view. You won't get quite as much of the blurry background, but it is still such a great value lens, and you can stick that on the FX30, along with, say, the Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4 or the 56. You can also use any full-frame lens for the E-mount that you want on this guy. Now, you can, of course, still use the APS-C lenses on the ZV-E1, but that's a 12 megapixel sensor. So you're, in order to uh, use the APS-C lenses, you're going to have to go clear image zoom. You're gonna to have to zoom in a fair bit. And while Sony says there is no loss in quality, there is, of course, a loss in quality when you're using clear image zoom because it's still a digital zoom and an upscale. So, I mean, maybe it's possible you won't perceive a quality loss, but there is a quality loss. Whereas with the, uh, FX30, you can get an APS-C lens, use the full IQ of the lens and sensor combination and get the best possible image. So the value of this guy, not only a cheaper body, but lenses that are much more affordable when you want more affordable lenses. And Sony's coming out with so many great lenses like that 11 millimeter right here, the 11 millimeter F1.8 that you can stick on this guy when you want to do the vlogging and whatnot. The 15 millimeter by Sony, fantastic. The 10 to 20, the Tamron 11 to 20, the list goes on and on. Fantastic APS-C lenses to go along with the regular full frame lenses that you can put on this bad boy. So in terms of price, you could do a full kit with a bunch of lenses and this guy for much cheaper than a full frame camera with full frame lenses. The LCD is much better on this guy. This is a 2.36 million dot LCD. It is the best LCD I have seen on a Sony camera and it is really a joy to use. Whereas the ZV-E1, it has no electronic viewfinder just like the FX30, but its screen is 1.04 million dots, I believe. I'll write it on the screen if I'm incorrect. It has two card slots, and both those card slots could be either SD cards or CF Express A type cards. So in terms of professional work, you always want redundant recording in case something happens to one of your cards. So to have two cards, I think is essential when you are getting paid to do work or you're trying to shoot footage that you definitely cannot lose. Now the ZV-E1, the only thing you can do because as the one card slot is you could get an external recorder. You could record internally to the camera and externally to the external recorder, and that is a way of getting around that aspect, but I think it is a huge bonus to have two card slots in the camera itself. And speaking of external output, this guy can output 16-bit linear RAW over HDMI, so you can record ProRes RAW, and you can definitely not do that on the ZV-E1. So once again, professionals looking for the ultimate flexibility who want to record in RAW, 
this is your camera. It has the Cine EI menu, which again, a lot of professionals, people working with FX6s, FX9s, they like that Cine EI menu. I certainly like it in the camera and I use it all the time. So I think the Cine EI menu is another advantage. It has a full-size HDMI port, whereas the ZV-E1 unfortunately only has the micro HDMI port. Full-size I think is so great, especially if you're gonna be connecting this to external monitors. Full-size HDMI port. I wish that was in every camera. That I say I wish? I wish it was in every camera going forward. I really do. I was disappointed. Like, they, $2,200 for the ZV-E1. I understand you have to cut costs, but $2,200 is still not a cheap camera. I would have liked to see a full-size HDMI port. You can also get a cable to get time code in. Once again, a professional feature for a professional workhorse of a camera. Speaking of workhorse of a camera, this one has a fan. It has active cooling. It is not going to overheat. So if you're going to do long shoots, you want to shoot 4K 60 for long periods of time, 4K 120 for long periods of time, or just in general, you're in a warm environment. You just don't want your camera shutting down. This is the way to go. The ZV-E1, to me, it looks like in standard temperatures, you know, shooting 4K 24, you're probably going to be fine for the most part. But once you try to stress that camera a little bit, you're going to probably run into some overheating issues. You just simply won't with this guy. Once again, professional, reliable workhorse. This guy is also weather sealed, whereas the ZV-E1 is dust and moisture resistant. Full weather sealing on this bad boy right here against the elements. It just has a much better build quality in general. It has a sturdy magnesium alloy body, which is the same one as the FX3. So I know you're getting a nice sturdy body. And look at all these, these all these mounting points right here, these quarter threads all around it. You don't even necessarily need a cage. You can just stick things to these mounting points. Speaking of lack of cages, you could just get this little optional XLR handle that goes right into the hot shoe there. And now you have a compact little cinema rig. You can buy the Sony XLR adapter as well for the hot shoe of the ZV-E1, but it's not going to have this great form factor where it can just hold the camera. You'll still need probably a cage if you're going to do that for the ZV-E1. It just has so many more buttons and dials for customization and also access like right here on the front, white balance, ISO, big record button, a little joystick on the top here, the buttons labeled on the back, just peaking and shutter and zebra. It's just, and this also has more dials, more dials as well. I have a dial dial here and a dial here on the back. And then of course you can use the wheel, whereas the ZV-E1, it just has one dial on the back and uh, then you have to use the scroll wheel as well. So this is just a more user-friendly camera. This is my favorite camera I have ever used in terms of video. It just makes taking video so easy. It's so quick. Everything is available for you. And lastly, I'll mention it has a 26 megapixel sensor. So if you're taking photos with this camera and the camera can take photos, then uh, you will have more room for cropping or printing large with a 26 megapixel sensor. So now let's move on to the advantages of the ZV-E1 and the star of the show here is definitely the sensor. This 12 megapixel full frame sensor is the same sensor that is in the A7S 3 the FX3 and the FX6. FX6 is a really expensive, fantastic camera and to get that sensor in a $2,200 body, that is really great because this sensor is going to gather a ton of light. The low light performance on this sensor is absolutely bananas. So if you're in S-Log3, you're going to have dual native ISOs of 640 and 12,800. So there is nothing out there in the Sony lineup that is going to compete with that type of low light performance that is on the ZV-E1. It is much better in low light than the FX30. That sensor will also give you 15 plus stops of dynamic range, whereas you get 14 stops or so on the FX30. The 4K 120, now I'm gonna put an asterisk by this right now because it's still only March 30th, 2023, and they have yet to release the free update that is coming for the 4K 120. So I'll just put an asterisk there, but they say it's going to be a 10% crop on the 4K 120. That is versus a 1.5 times crop that the FX30 has. And the FX30, and I don't mean because it's an APS-C, I mean on top of their regular APS-C crop, you go in another 1.5 times. But to me, that's not the drawback of the 4K on the FX30. I use it all the time. And in good light at uh, the base ISO of 800 in S-Log3, it looks pretty good, but there's a bit of noise there. And that noise can really show up in some scenes. I find that the 4K 120, even at its lowest base ISO, is quite noisy 
on the FX30. There have been shots I have used when I'm trying to show products and stuff out in the wild that are unusable because the noise is just too great. In good light, you probably won't notice it, but once the light is not perfect or you have a shadowy area, you're going to see a lot of noise from that 4K 120 on the FX30. So that's why I'm going to say it is a double advantage for the ZV-E1 to have a 4K 120 that is not only less of a crop, but also is going to have much less noise. It's going to have better rolling shutter. The rolling shutter is not great on the FX30. It's not too bad, but the rolling shutter is going to be very good on the ZV-E1 because it'll be the same rolling shutter that you get on the FX3 and the A7S3, which is fantastic. It also has better internal mics with more options. So if you're someone who's not going to plug in a microphone, but you really should, plug in a microphone, but if you're not going to, then the ZV-E1 definitely has a better on-camera mic. It has a new stabilization mode called dynamic stabilization. So other than just the active steady shot, now you can do the dynamic active steady shot. And once again, this is going to be even better at stabilizing footage. So if you're doing a lot of handheld work, the ZV-E1 is probably going to look better. It has the A7R5's autofocus system. So which this is fantastic. It has the AI chip, so it will actually use the AI for the autofocus and it recognizes different things, not just people and birds and animals, but insects and cars and planes. It is a more advanced autofocus system and it's a very exciting one that I will be happy to use. The uh, FX30's autofocus is fantastic. It's great. Nothing to complain about at all, but the uh, Sony's really up the game with this new AI autofocus system. And speaking of the AI, there's something called AI tracking where you can just set your camera up on a tripod and then you can just move around the frame and the uh, actual, it'll crop in and it will follow you as if it's a camera operator following you. Now, I don't know how usable that is because I haven't tested it out myself. I don't know if you, I saw some stuttering, depending on your settings maybe, but it looks like it works pretty well and is certainly something I would like to try. And the people they're aiming this at, the vloggers who are doing more lower stakes things, I think that this will work pretty well. I think it's a nice little advantage. Similarly, they have a framing stabilizer where they, if you want to stay in the center of the frame, keep a subject there or pick a point to put the subject in that part of the frame and just keep that person or object there, then the camera will help you by once again, just cropping in a little bit and trying to keep the object you're tracking where you want it to track. That's the product showcase mode, which is going to be useful for a lot of people that they are actually targeting. The content creators, people doing YouTube, want to show off products and stuff, just hold it up right there, boom, locks right on, take it down, goes right back to your gorgeous eyes. It is just, that's a really nice feature to have. I have it on the ZV-E10, used all the time. I love it. And uh, I think that that is going to pay dividends for a lot of content creators. I mean, you can set up the FX30 to just have like a center focus and then uh, put all of the speed settings up on bust and then it'll work similarly, but then you have to dig into the menus, do that. And when you want to get out of it, you have to change the menus back instead of just pressing one button, which actually will work better than doing it yourself. Now, this is one I like a lot, and that is has a new time-lapse mode where you can just press the button and it will make the time-lapse for you. So it will take all of the pictures and then spit them out in a 4K file for you. And I love that. The Panasonics that I've had in the past, they were able to do that. And I preferred making time lapses that way because I'm usually making the time lapses for these videos. So I want something quick and done for me. But, you know, I've been using the S and Q mode a lot in the Sony system, but the S and Q mode, you just have to leave it running. Whereas, you know, the time lapse, you can set up like your regular photo time lapse and you can run that for a long period of time or and then it'll just make the file for you and you're done. And you can still do it the traditional way with the pictures, and you can also still use the S and Q, but I love that little time-lapse movie made for you right in camera. You're gonna be able to change the settings right on the screen here. Not just press the buttons to start and stop, but change the shutter speed and the ISO, things like that. And uh, that's something that Canon cameras have had for quite a while. And so I'm I'm happy to see it on the ZV-E1 because that is something that's quite useful. It has a lot of great features for the newer content creator, like that background, defocus, you just press the button, background goes out of focus or in focus. Or also in intelligent auto mode, you have this mode where if you're just holding up to your face and other faces come into the screen, then it will adjust the aperture so that all of the faces 
are in focus. That's pretty cool. And there's also a mode that you can use in all the modes where you can register a face and lock onto that. So you have somebody at a wedding. You can just show that person at a wedding. Maybe the best man. Maybe that is who you want to focus on. The bride and groom. Who cares about them? And only his face will be in focus when all of the faces are in the frame because the best man is me. And you can actually change things in the intelligent auto mode. You can change the white balance a little bit here and there. So you can just make these small tweaks. So you can just let the camera do all the work, make a few decisions for yourself and you're good to go. And speaking of letting the camera do the work, they have a cinematic vlog mode, which gives you these fake black bars and then makes it like an S cine tone, but you can choose a few different looks. And that might be great for a lot of people. Just you want a quick vlog, but you want it to look pretty good, little cinematic thing, you know, you just set that up, press the button, right? In terms of photos, even though it's 12 megapixels compared to 26 megapixels, I would take the ZV-E1's photo capabilities over the FX30 because uh, it actually will do burst mode, even though it still just has an electronic shutter just like the FX30, no mechanical shutter, but the rolling shutter is less, first of all, so that's better. And also it can do burst rate. It can do 10 frames per second, whereas the FX30 can only do one frame. So that's why the ZV-E1 is going to be a much better hybrid in terms of photos and video than the FX30. It will also stream up to 4K30. Now there is a caveat with that. Don't stream for long with 4K30 as it'll probably overheat. If you wanna you know, show your video games for three hours, that's not gonna work. You're gonna have to go to 1080 anyway, which also the uh, FX30 can do. The FX30 can only go to 4K 15 frames per second, frames, 15 frames per second, but then uh, you, so you'll be doing 1080 on both cameras probably, but in short bursts, you can do the 4K 30 on the ZV-E1. Also, the ZV-E1 is smaller and lighter, 483 grams compared to 646 grams. So the question then becomes, what type of shooter are you? If you're a professional shooter, you're on shoots with clients, you're getting paid, I think you have to do the FX30. It just has many more features that professionals will need. Reliable, fan, two card slots, raw recording externally. It's just, it's not gonna break down on you. This is the one to take when people are paying you money. But if everything you're doing is a personal project and you don't mind reshooting if something goes wrong, the card slot corrupts or it happens to overheat, if it's not the end of the world, the image quality that you are going to get out of the ZV-1 is going to be second to none, really. Just the low light performance, bonkers, dynamic range, bonkers, the image is just gonna be so great. You get all that full frame glory. Like right now I'm using a 24 millimeter F1.4 and it makes the background look a little separated from me. This background is right behind me. Look at this. I am touching this thing right there, but it looks nice and blurred out at the 1.4 on the full frame. And also it's great in this, like right now I don't have a lot of lights on here in the studio. And as you can see, not very noisy, nice and clean. And that is because of this nice full frame sensor in the a7 IV. So, I mean, these things are big advantages, not to mention the 4K 120 at a 10% crop, which is probably going to be a lot cleaner 4K. But that 4K probably won't be able to shoot very long without overheating because the 4K 60 in the ZV-E1 is uh, limited to about 30 minutes, they say, from Sony. So I can't imagine the 4K 120 is going to go longer than that. So if you think I missed some points, just write them down below so that we can all read them and benefit or laugh at you depending on what you write. Give me your opinion on the ZV-E1 versus the FX30. Which one would you get and why? I am seriously interested and I will read them all today when this video is out because I don't have anything else to do in my life except obsess over my YouTube comments. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.